Recording in progress. Hello, and welcome back to Come Follow Me with Fair Faithful Answers to New Testament Questions. I am Jennifer Roach. Today, we are going to talk about polygamy. But, but whether this is a wise choice or a foolish choice, we will find out, but it's what we're talking about. Um, I think you know, if you have made it this far, we are going through the Come Follow Me readings, just picking out some verses as we go along that would illustrate some questions that evangelicals might have about our faith, so that when these things come up in conversation with your evangelical friends and family members, you might be able to have a little bit better conversation, understand where they're coming from with the ultimate goal of being able to share some of the gifts of our faith with them. And this conversation about polygamy is probably not going where you think it's going to go. And by the end, you should have a pretty solid idea on what it means on this topic to share some good things from our faith, um, <laughs> even on a controversial topic like polygamy. Okay, we are on week 43 of this 52-week project. I have teased you a little bit about changes that are coming for next year. I am still not ready to spill the beans, but... Um, we had a planning meeting about all of it yesterday. I'm really, really encouraged. It does not make sense to do the, what do evangelicals think about um, next year as we're doing Book of Mormon year. It has to get framed a little bit differently. Um, and so we're working on that. I am not going anywhere <laughs> for better or for worse. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, but here we are. Okay. Our jumping off point today, 1 Timothy 3, 2, therefore... An overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. It's a lovely little list that Paul gives us, and you can understand why an evangelical friend or family member who knows anything about our faith might be like, wait a minute, like, aren't you guys disobeying this Bible verse? What in the world is going on with you? I thought it could be just a good jumping in point for us. Before we start, let me set an expectation, okay? This is not an apologetic for polygamy, right? I'm not going to tell you why polygamy is good. I'm not going to tell you all of the reasons why I think it's this wonderful thing, right? That ain't what, that ain't what we're doing here. We're not making a, a polygamy apologetic. But we're also not going to be afraid of the messiness of history. And here, here's where... Like, I just really need to set some expectations in this episode. We are not going to talk through all of the issues that Latter-day Saints struggle with regarding polygamy. One, there is no time. Two, there are people far better um, versed in all of this to talk about it. I want to give you three resources. If this is an issue you struggle with, I get it, right? Like, I have talked to a lot, a lot, a lot of people where this is heartbreak, not just in the past, but some current versions of heartbreak for them. And th the struggle over this deserves respect and it deserves good resources. Number one, if you do not know the work of Brian Hales, you should. Um, he is the very best source um, for learning the history of polygamy, specifically Joseph Smith's polygamy. Um, his, his website is josephsmithspolygamy.org. It should be your first stop if you are wanting to see kind of an in-depth display of all the original documents as it relates to Joseph specifically. Brian and his um, his then wife, Laura, Paris Hales, um, they created that site. Laura, man, Laura was amazing and kind and good. Um, she is past now. I gave my first talk for FAIR in 2020. I was nervous, as nervous could be. Um, and Laura was the speaker who spoke right before me. And we had never met um, and we chatted just a little bit. And she sort of just said like, you and I are gonna be friends because you need to know some of the things I can tell you. I said, okay, we're friends. <laughs> and I mean, maybe she wasn't that blunt about it but in essence, she kind of gave me the lowdown on setting expectations of like, you can grapple with messy history and still be okay in your faith. Um, and it was a time of development where I really needed to hear that, um, especially from a woman, especially from someone in our church who had really, really studied all of this. If you need a resource in, in all of that, Laura is past. However, her, um, her work lives on. She has a talk on the 
FAIR website, the FAIR YouTube channel on Helen Mark Kimball's kind of later in life reflections on having lived a life of polygamy. Helen was sealed to Joseph when she was like 14. Um, it gets really complicated for us today. Like that ain't that no joke. But Helen's own words written a lifetime after living polygamy in, in a couple of different situations. They're the essence of what it means to embrace faith in the midst of some real messy stuff. Um, and understanding Helen Mark Kimball through Laura's understanding of her, but it's just a really, really, if you're struggling, please go find that talk. Um, my very favorite genre of faith building is being able to talk about the messy, the difficult, the doubts, the questions, all those things, and still at the end of the day, landing on faith, even when you don't have the answers. Like I am just sort of obsessed with that dynamic. Um, and if you need that around polygamy, Brian's site um, is a great, the josephsmithpolygamy.org, Laura's talk. Um, Brian is still very much alive and well. And just last week released a paper on Joseph Smith's education. It's called Joseph Smith's Education and Intellect as Described in Documentary Sources. Our friends at Interpreter Foundation have it up on their website. It's 8,000 words, it's 120 footnotes. Go work your way through it if that's a topic that interests you. The dude pumps out work and it's all impressive. Anyway, tangent. Um, second, um, you should know about the 2020 talk um, at FAIR by Don Bradley. Don is a proper historian. Um, even somebody like Brian was an anesthesiologist. I think he's retired now, um, not trained for an entire career in history work, Don was. This is, this is what his training is in. And his talk a couple months ago at FAIR, he kind of brings to light some new information. It changes the timeline of Joseph's polygamy. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to give you the, the punchline because you really should go listen to this talk. But it will snap several problematic things into place for you. And it is absolutely worth your time. Um, cannot recommend that talk highly enough. Third, um, there's a little tiny book, um, Brittany Chapman Nash, Let's Talk About Polygamy. It's less than 150 pages. Um, Brittany is a historian. She worked for the church for a long time. She was on the Young Women's General Advisory Board. She writes this, I think it's 130 pages, very plain language. It is a great resource if you're sort of just stepping into Oh no, I don't know what to think about this messy topic. So that's three for you. If you are struggling with this topic as a Latter-day Saint, please go talk to those folks, right? Go listen to what they have to say. They will model for you what it's like to prioritize faith even in the middle of messy history. Okay, what we are going to do today, which is what we always do here, is talk about how speaking with um, a hard topic with evangelicals, like what are some ideas on how that conversation could go? So. Before I was interested in the church, I kind of knew some rough details that polygamy had been practiced in our church. Movies, TV, like just the vaguest sketch of kind of here's an outline of basically what happens. I could not have told you times or dates or names. I just knew it had happened. Um, but even that small amount of knowledge that I had it is a little bit more maybe than a lot of evangelicals have as evidenced by this story. Since joining the church, I've probably received four or five messages from friends who've watched like various TV shows. And, and I get a text that says something like, Hey, I'm watching such and such TV show about your church. Um, like you doing okay. We'll come to find out they're not watching anything about our church. They're watching something about Warren Jeffs or whatever, right? Like they conflate all of the groups and it's understandable why they're similar name. Like I, I get why they're conflating it. Those TV shows don't particularly help them <laughs> disambiguate it, to be honest. But 
people who worry that they, those issues are still happening in our church, like they're calling me to check on me, make sure I haven't been like smuggled off as someone's plural wife. I don't know. They're doing it. They're really kind hearted. They're just like, they're worried about me as a person more than the concept. I don't even think they know what to do with the concept. I would say most evangelicals have an understanding that somewhere between those two markers, my friend who who can't keep Warren Jeffs straight that like he's not part of our church all the way up to me who's like yeah I know polygamy happened that's all I know um so when they think about polygamy you need to know that their imaginations are populated by what they see on television and probably not the actual historical realities but even if you could explain all of that to them. I, and, I, and I think many, if not most Latter-day Saints could talk through this issue with a greater degree of depth than an evangelical could, just because you've probably grown up in it. Even if you can do that, you still have a problem. An evangelical interprets this verse in 1 Timothy to mean that all expressions of polygamy are bad for all times and for all places and for all people. And this is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to have ever happened. They will get real squeamish <laughs> if you explain that practically everyone in the Old Testament not only had plural wives, but concubines. And like, there's a lot of stuff that would not make sense in like our modern world. Um, but they will probably respond back to you as something like, well, yeah, they might have done that, but God didn't like it. God didn't allow it. They just did it. Um, and that's sort of how they how they get around like that piece of their history. And it was so long ago, it doesn't really bother them. Um, you can point out that like 30% of the countries in the world still allow polygamy today. Um, that it's just they don't care, right? It's just, it's it's not something that they are really going to ever be like, oh, huh, yeah, I can see why your church needed to practice that for a time. That makes so much sense. I don't think that's a path that gets you anywhere. However, things are changing for evangelicals and, and have been probably for the last 25 years pretty steeply. In 2003, Gallup does a survey. They find 7% of adult Americans thought polygamy was morally acceptable. By 2020, less than 20 years later, that number was over 20% of people who thought it was morally acceptable. And 35% of adults who consider themselves politically liberal say, yeah, polygamy is morally acceptable as long as all the adults are consenting and children are taken care of. What's the problem? You would not have seen that attitude even from um, progressive liberal political people you would not have seen that attitude probably even 30 years ago this is sort of the spot where i walked in to our church um i i wouldn't describe myself as particularly liberal but i lived in a very liberal west coast city for 25 years and that exposes you to a wide variety of people and lifestyles where the automatic response of most people is love is love. You you want to construct your family in a certain way, construct your family in whatever way, as long as you're being ethical about it, who cares? Um, when I was investigating the church, that was kind of the, like the cultural soup that I was living in. So when the issue of polygamy first came up, um, it was part of me learning about the church. My response was something like, love who you want to love, marry who you want to marry. Why should I care? Um, and I was really, really, really surprised, kind of shocked, actually, when the conversation came up with two women friends from church. They were members, have been members their whole lives, several generations back, I'm asking, you know, I'm just in the phase where I'm just asking like every question I have about things. And when I, you know, brought this up to them, um, what they thought about the history of polygamy in our church or, or even the issue in general, what happened was they really fell all 
over themselves trying to tell me how bad they thought it was, right? They wanted to put lots and lots of distance between today and what was happening in the 1800s. It was, oh no, absolutely, we, we do not do that. And that's not true, right? Like you can't practice that in our church. We don't do that. <laughs> um, but I was confused. My liberal cultural had, culture had taught me uh, you don't get to have an opinion on other people's marriages. That That's none of your business. Um, now I get what my friends were doing there, right? I was an investigator. I had not joined the church yet. They were trying not to freak me out and scare me off. I see the goodness and all of that and the goodness in their motivation. But the interesting part, I was far less worried about the issue than they were. It, 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 as time went on, I learned more. And there are parts of this topic that I struggled with harder than others. I, I struggled with Joseph's polyandry, his, his marrying of women who were already, or getting sealed to women who were already married, right? Like I did a real good double take on that one. Um, by the way, if you struggle with that one, please go watch Dawn's talk, August, 2023. It's on the fair YouTube channel. That will, that will help alleviate that problem for you. Um, my initial reaction to the topic of polygamy was kind of a, so what, what does that have to do with me? And to be honest, I really haven't moved all that far from that. I understand the problems. I understand the theological framework that supports polygamy that is still found in our church today. Um, I listened to 100 episodes of a very popular podcast talking about polygamy. Um, and perhaps I am not the typical example here. I've said that to you on a number of topics, but perhaps I am not the typical example here. But what I've observed is that people inside the church are way more touchy about this subject than people outside of it, especially if they are people who are in any kind of big city where maybe liberal thinking um, kind of rules the day. So all of that to say, you might actually be surprised that this conversation could go an entirely different way than you imagine. You, Latter day Saint friend, might have far more complicated feelings about this than someone outside of our faith actually does. And you're allowed to have complicated feelings here. There's plenty of help for that. Um, but you need to know that evangelicals don't really walk into this conversation with the same baggage. They just don't. So here's the other direction I want to go on this. I think sometimes we... As Latter-day Saints, look at Protestants widely, evangelicals specifically, as being a people who don't really have to grapple with history as hard as we do in our church. And I mean, since we're talking about polygamy, I will use polygamy as the example here. I think there are two reasons for this. One, evangelicals are perfectly aware that polygamy happened in the Old Testament. But that was a really, really, really long time ago. Meanwhile, in our church, there are people alive today whose grandparents were polygamists. Right? Like there, there's there's family stories of, of people that they knew who, who were living in this life. It, there is not the luxury of saying, oh yeah, that's stuff that happened 3,000 years ago. It didn't happen to anybody I know or am related to. Like We don't have that luxury in our church. And I'm actually kind of glad for that. And I will tell you why. Hang in there. Um, to be honest, in general, evangelicals are, are fairly unaware. <laughs> the Bible ends and then there's today. And there's 2,000 years of history in there. And most of them are pretty unaware of what happened in the church, in the history, even of their church. They can tell you the high points. Catholic church goes off the rails. The Reformation happens. There's some Puritans. And now here we are. Like, that, that's just, if you're not obsessed with history, that's probably what you know. However, <laughs> um, 
there is a great deal that happened in there and things that really, really muddle the, muddy the waters. Martin Luther, the great reformer, the father of Protestantism said, I confess that I cannot forbid a person to marry several wives. It doesn't contradict scripture. If a man wishes to marry more than one wife, he should be asked whether he is satisfied in his conscience that he may do so in accordance with the word of God. In such a case, the civil authority has nothing to do with the matter. But that's Martin Luther advocating for polygamy 500 years ago. Um, but for most evangelicals, even that, even 500 years ago, it just does not feel real or relevant to them. It's just something in the long ago past, um, which, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the reasons why this historical stuff is a little bit easier on them than, than it is on us. The second reason, um, if you're an evangelical listening, I know that you won't love the way that I say this. And please know, I, I don't mean any offense by this. I just mean it as a fact. Evangelicalism is a very young faith. It's younger than ours. They, they, they really don't even start gaining any steam until after World War II, right? Like right when the baby boom, how many baby boomers are still alive? Like it's a very, very, very young version of faith. The cultural kind of zeitgeist of post-World War II America was prioritizing the modern and the new. Everything was about the future. New is better than old. Uh, modern is better than traditional. And so culturally, evangelicals have developed over the last 75 years in a way that that has really shaped how they tell their own origin stories. It's kind of... Um, Jesus did some stuff, blah, 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 and here's our church. Um, think of the biggest evangelical church in your town. I can almost guarantee you that their origin story is something like, well, Pastor Bill just wanted to study the Bible with his good friends, and so they started a Bible study in his living room, and then pretty soon it grew into a church, and now here we all are. And that's how they tell their story of where they came from. That's a pretty tidy story. Um, but you also have to understand that's a very edited story. Um, Jesus did some stuff, dies, rose again, fast forward 2000 years, here we are. Th th there is a lot left out of that. And it might be true that Pastor Bill started their church in his living room, um, but they're leaving out a lot. Because it's culturally allowed, even expected, for their story to be told that way, they're mostly just used to it. They just accept it. Nobody really asks um, harder questions on that. They know they know Pastor Bill. They listen to him every week, and he started this church, and yay, it's great. Um, and in that sense, they really do have it easier than we do. Um, but this is sort of actually the payoff on this topic. And this is what I want you to hear. Faith is messy. <laughs> History is messy. People are messy. There was a time in our church's history when a more sanitized version of history was being told. And, and that happened for a lot of reasons, and they are all understandable. But we've mostly moved past that. Um, and we grapple with this stuff now and that's culturally allowed in our church and yes some people leave over these issues they do you you probably know some um but have you met the people who know the depths of these issues polygamy and things like it and they don't abandon their faith they don't leave people who can struggle with these issues and at the end of the day, their faith is intact. If you're if you're watching this, I suspect there is at least some of that in you. I hope there's some of that in me. Um, you have no idea what a cultural gift that is in our church at this moment in history, right? All of the 
exposing of these things that are very difficult to think through, like polygamy and others, um, it has also shined a light on just because you know um, disturbing facts does not mean you have to lose your faith over it. And that, um, I need that. You need that. The entire world needs that kind of faith. Um, the person who goes to church and the origin story is like, hey, Pastor Bill in his living room Bible study, they don't have to develop that skill in the same way. But But you have had to. Um, they don't have to deal with the messier details. It's still obscured from their sight. Maybe in a similar way to how our church's history used to kind of be a little bit obscured from people's sight. And to be honest, like it's always been in books. It's all, but I think like a lot of people don't read and people could have found that information if they wanted to. And a lot of people just preferred not to, to be honest, that's my assessment of it. Um, but because at least in the last 20 years, probably more, people in our church have had to grapple with the messy. And that has produced a good number of folks who know how to do that. And at the end of the day, they still choose faith. I am obsessed with these people. I hope and long to be one. So my whole point here is not even to prep you on how to have a talk about polygamy with outsiders. I don't even think that's a very interesting conversation, to be honest, unless they were particularly interested in it. A, a large number of them won't even care. Love is love. Let, just let them do what they want. But there's a pretty easy pivot you know, from a conversation about a really hard topic like this, polygamy, there's a pretty easy pivot into a conversation of how to keep faith alive when it's messy, when things are disappointing, when you learn facts that are shocking. Um, and the normal evangelical is only dealing with this a tiny little bit compared to what, um, I mean, honestly, what people are dealing with in our church, not because there aren't hard issues there. There are, they don't tell their story. They don't tell their story that way yet. I think they'll get there. They're way younger than we are. They will get to that point as a faith where they're having to tell the more complex versions of their story, but they're not there yet. Um, one of the greatest gifts of our faith that you might not even see if you have been in this church your whole life, but helping people maintain faith as they wade through complex issues. That is one of the gifts that we bring to the table. Um, even if you're not encouraging your evangelical friend towards our particular faith, if you're just encouraging them towards faith in Jesus Christ, my goodness, is there a, is there a greater skill that's needed in the world today? There, is, there isn't. Um, I hope and aspire to be able to do that for other people. I know that you do too. Okay. <laughs> there, there you go. Um, the, seriously, though, if you are hurting or struggling over this issue, and I know plenty of people are, the resources I listed at the top of the show can absolutely help you out. Um, sometimes you see this cynical attitude from critics of the church that say like, well, if you knew everything I knew, you would leave the church too. And that is just ridiculously untrue. Um, every one of those folks and the sources that I mentioned can can really model for you or show you what it's like to know all the details, to know all the messiest details. And, and faith doesn't die because of historical details. Okay, next week, priesthood of all believers. That'll be a fun conversation. I think you will have a great time with it. Evangelicals, um, th that's a topic that they would be interested in talking about. Okay, very good. I will see you then.